is a great way for us to celebrate one of the most important figures in the history of Audubon Naturalist Society, Rachel Carson, a woman who brought the nation together to stop threats against the environment. And in fact, didn't just influence our nation, but influenced the world and got us to pay attention to the fact that the indiscriminate use of pesticides was terrorizing the biological world. I think of her with awe. When I started at Audubon Natural Society in 2005, I thought, I am so fortunate to work at an institution that has been um, the home of people of the caliber of Rachel Carson. Not only was she an Audubon Natural Society member and a board member and the winner of the society's highest award, she was also a frequent contributor to the Atlantic Naturalist, which was our newsletter of the time. And I invite you when we have the chance to get back together again, to come into Woodend and go into our library and take some of those volumes of the Atlantic Naturalist off the shelves and treat yourself to the writings of Rachel Carson. She was called a poet. And one of the things about the lockdown for me is that it has given me a chance to reconnect to nature poetry. And when I think about Rachel Carson as an author, lots of people go right to Silent Spring and think about that as her most important work. But one of the things that was miraculous about Rachel Carson is that she was writing nonfiction books about science but they were so poetic that they became bestsellers. And this is at a time when nonfiction books did not frequently make the bestseller list. I think about, um, for example, one of her books, The Sea Around Us, which was a National Book Award winner, and it read like poetry. So even though it was highly accurate scientifically, Rachel Carson had such a beautiful writing style that she was accessible to the whole nation. Um, and that's what made Silent Spring eventually so important. I think about her as a scientist first. She didn't grow up on the ocean, but she fell in love with it and became a scientist who studied the intricacies of the ocean ecosystem. And that was pretty new thinking at the time she was doing it. And as she progressed in her career and began to get this inkling that our indiscriminate use of pesticides was a danger to our life as we knew it, she began to collaborate with other scientists. And it was a time when people were trying to muzzle the thinking. Industry didn't want any news about pesticides to come out on the negative side. Rachel Carson even had to have clandestine exchanges of data from other government scientists so that she could get all the facts together to put Silent Spring together. And then of course, when Silent Spring was published and became so incredibly popular, she was basically called on the carpet. She had to testify before Congress. She was vilified in the media. She was um, attacked by chemical industry figures. They called her things like the cat lady they tried to muzzle the really good science that she had put into Silent Spring. And unfortunately, I think that sounds a little familiar to what's happening today when we think about our government scientists. What some of you might not know is that when Rachel Carson was writing Silent Spring and when she was testifying before Congress, she was also dying of cancer. And that's a really sad tale. She never let it out that she was suffering, but she was suffering when she was testifying. And I like to think that it was her ANS community that stood behind her and said, you go girl, this is a hard road that you've taken, but we are with you. I think particularly of her friend, Shirley Briggs, who was another ANS member and board member and Barch Award winner. And how as a community, Audubon Naturalist Society stood up for good science, just like we do today. 
you may know that Rachel Carson's work really was the foundation of our Environmental Protection Agency. The roots were formed with the publication of Silent, uh, Silent Spring. John F. Kennedy was a big advocate for the creation of an agency that would protect our environment. And believe it or not, it was Richard Nixon who signed into law the agency's genesis. So protecting the environment used to be a bipartisan effort. I think it can be that again someday. In some ways, I'd like to think that we've come full circle in that we are back to arguing with the government about getting scientific data out there and using that data to make good decisions about environmental protection and certainly about human health. I think it's really important for us to remember that the roots of Audubon Natural Society are in using science to protect the environment. And who better embodies that than our very own Rachel Carson? But in some ways, we've also come a long way and we're a lot further ahead than we were in the 1960s when Silent Spring was published. And I'm gonna share a screen if I can do this successfully with you to show you what I mean. Now, can you all see that? Look at what Rachel Carson had to wear when she went birding. This is a picture of Rachel Carson in Glover Archibald Park. And can you imagine wearing a pleated skirt and probably a tweed jacket and a headscarf every time you had to go out birding? So while Rachel Carson did remarkable things for science, for the environment, for good government guidance, I am glad that we have progressed beyond pleated skirts when we go birding. That's a little bit of an irreverent way to um, stop this recognition of Rachel Carson. But we have so many good speakers. We have five more speakers who are gonna talk to us about their feelings about Rachel Carson's life and legacy. And I get to turn it over to Anna Tuquin from the National Park Service. And Anna is gonna talk about Rachel Carson's legacy at the National Park Service. Anna, I know you're here. I'm here. Can you all hear me? Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy birthday, Miss Rachel Carlson. I'm very happy and delighted to talk to you today and to share a little bit of uh, what the National Park Service, what uh, Rock Creek Park is uh, doing following the legacy of uh, Rachel. Um, Lisa, as Lisa had said, my name is Anna Chukin, and uh, I am the botanist for Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C., one of the units of the National Park Service. I, um, uh, uh, I graduated um, with a uh, uh, degree in biology and natural resources management from the University of Maryland and Towson University. And I currently work for Rock Creek Park, um, one of the oases in Washington, D.C. Rock Creek Park, it's a 3,000 acre urban park. Um, if we can see one of the pictures sent, uh, we can see that uh, Rock Creek is located right in the middle, and we almost neighbor uh, ANS. Uh, we're very close. We start at the boundary of Silver Spring and uh, Washington, D.C., and we go all the way down to almost the Kennedy Center. Rock Creek Park was um, inaugurated and created at the turn of the century and had originally one large reservation. Uh, as time went by, um, several other green spaces reservations were added to the park. And one of these is what we know now as Glover Archibald. That will be the greatest connection to Rachel. Um, as I mentioned to you, Rock Creek serves as an oasis for Washingtonians. And that was the original thought behind the park. Uh, people that were not able, that did not have the time to go out of the city, could just come and enjoy nature and feel right in the middle of nowhere, just being one with nature in a matter of minutes, in a matter of a bike ride. And um, that's, I think, where um, a 
Glover Arch, uh, Charles Glover and Anne Archbold come into uh, the picture. These two people donated an immense amount of land, about 180 acres of land that later on was um, uh, become managed by Rock Creek Park. And that's where we see the big connection with uh, uh, Rachel, because we have the picture that Lisa showed before as um, uh, when she was birding uh, as a part of an Audubon Natural Society group. Uh, we have um, data and we have multiple connections and we know of now that um, she not only visited and not only uh, walked and bird and was very familiar with uh, forest land around Silver Spring, but also with this piece of land. As time passed, neighbors from this area of Glover Archbold worked with the Park Service and were able to recognize certain areas within Glover Archbold, um, these 183 acres, so that people can see what Rachel saw. People can experience what Rachel experienced with her friends while walking through these areas in the 60s. And I feel like that's where, that's a great point where these two worlds, the world of the National Park Service and the world of uh, Rachel idea and legacy come together. Um, let me read uh, the mission of the Park Service. The Park Service preserves and impair the natural and cultural resources and values of the, nat the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of these and future generations. Uh, on Silent Spring, Rachel writes the following. There is a great chance that the next generation will have no chance to know nature as we do. If we don't preserve the damage, will be irreversible. And that's what we do every day. That's why we're trying to prevent we want to protect what we have under our wings and so that not only these, but next, the next generation can enjoy it. And that's what um, not only the National Park Service, but Rock Creek Park does every day through a series of works, through series of uh, management decisions. Um, so um, I think Rachel represents a great um, um, legacy and somebody that we want to follow on her footsteps on uh, her ideas. And we have her more present than ever when we go to Glover Archbowl and we are still able to see a very similar um, scenery as she did. And not only, this is not only on history, but it can be also presented on pictures. Um, now let's talk about a little bit in detail on what park service detail or specific management decisions are following her ideas and footsteps. Um, we have a strong pesticide review process because we know that that was one of the points that she worked specifically on. We use the IPM, the Integrated Pest Management Process, into identifying what and deciding what is the tr right treatment for each management case. We don't only make a decision based on a problem. Once we get a problem, we study the problem and we figure out what is the more environmental friendly uh, solution to the problem. In many cases, the problem gets solved by the use of volunteers, by the use of, uh, by, the, by finding solution with partner friends, with um, the general public. Um, the solution can be solved right there with the input from the public. Other times, it depends on what the problem at hand is, but we basically go to that point first into trying to find a solution that is friendly to the environment. We have continued with the research that we do. We have a strong uh, program on forest health in which we not only um, uh, take 
basically um, uh, research data from the park every year, but we act upon the results that this research data provides. I invite you all to look onto um, the National Park Service, National Capital Area Inventory and Monitoring Program website. Um, you can learn in a very interactive way about all the research that is taking place in the park. Not only plant research, but animal research, bird research, uh, water research, uh, so that our management decisions can be based on science. Um, we also have several restoration uh, uh, programs, not only tree planting, but restoration of several areas. And this is another point in which I come up to uh, say that the work with partners and the work together makes a bigger, um, better result. Uh, we have worked with multiple groups in the past and that's, and we have come up with the, with the decision that working together makes us more effective. We have worked with multiple groups such as um, the Rocky Conservancy, the Dunbar Knox Conservancy, Casey Trees, among so many, uh, so that we have uh, restored several areas, again, for the enjoyment of these and future generations. And last but not least, I would like to leave you all with um, a question. What can you do to help? It's really nice to read about Rachel and to admire her work, but I think it, it needs to go far. It needs to go further on, on actions that you can take. Um, you can um, explore nature. You can just go out and walk and just take it in. You can encourage your kids to do that. Because remember, Rachel's ideals and, the, and her first learnings when where she was a kid. It didn't start as an adult. It grew on her when she was a kid. So that is the right age to get started. Not when you're 20, 25, but when you're barely walking. And I think these um, timings have been a great opportunity for a lot of family to do that. It's very nice to see families going out and exploring the outdoors. Of course, respecting all regulations put in place. Volunteering, it's another, uh, it's another way to follow her legacy. Finding out what you like to do and, and, and following and completing and, and joining a group to volunteer. Reading about her work, reading on what she did, on reading on, uh, on entities that are following her footsteps. Um, take parks and take nature home. It's another idea. That might, might sound um, different, but it's a new idea that can take us really, really far away. Uh, if you're about to plant something at home, think about what you're planting. Do a little study into how that will benefit nature, how that will benefit the, the native community within the area where you live. Think what you're planting and try to plant things that are environmental friendly, that are native, that will benefit the ecosystem around you. Um, encourage or explore careers in science. And I think that brings it up home for me. Um, being a Latina, it's very um, rare to see minorities or see Latinas that, uh, that work in science. Um, I think that is one of the main aspects of what I present and why, why I try to talk to you because um, encouraging and trying to share your knowledge and trying to become uh, an example of that is worth doing. So um, um, trying to explore science uh, careers or share with others will be another great thing to do. Um, I will end up this talk by um, reading a last quote from Rachel that I think uh, hits home, especially during this time that we are going through. And um, let me just read it for you. It is a wholesome and necessary thing for us to turn again to the earth and in contemplation of her beauties, to know of wonder and humility. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you, Anna. What a beautiful quote. And I just, I'm sure you would suspect this already, but Anna really walks the talk. She volunteers for Audubon Natural Society on our Wood End 2065 committee, and she is helping us steward the restoration of Wood End for the next generations. So thank you for that, Anna. Now I'm going to turn the microphone over to our own Shannon Earle, the Audubon Nature Preschool Forest Kindergarten teacher. And Shannon is going to uh, give us an example of how we teach like Rachel Carson teaches. Hi, everybody. So nice to see you. And Anna, thank you so much for that inspiring talk. I actually got my start in environmental education through the National Park Service. It was one of my first jobs out of college and one of the first places that I took workshops and got some training in environmental education and inspired the rest of my career. So, um, and like that, Rachel Carson's life really inspires much of what we do and how we teach at the Audubon Nature Preschool, which offers programs for um, children and fam families from birth to age um, six to seven. Um, and in addition to the wealth of research that shows all of the ways that teaching outdoors and that nature education really supports um, children's development, there's also a lot of research that was inspired by Rachel Carson's life and her legacy. So in environmental education, we have the goal of creating those informed, caring, active citizens like Rachel and like many of you. And, and so some researchers have looked into the lives of some of our country's most important conservation leaders. And of course, Rachel Carson was right at the top of that list. But others like Aldo Leopold, John Muir, Thoreau, Theodore Roosevelt, what are some of the commonalities in their lives that led them to become such active and, and um, con committed conservationists? So they looked at things like their childhood experiences, family influences, media, education, the environment that they were brought up in. And, and one thing that they found was that spending time in nature, outdoors, interacting, particularly as children, in the company of caring adults was a common thread through those conservationist lives. They also had things like attachment to a particular place or the influence of a family member and education, of course, but really more than formal education, it was education in nature. It was learning about birds and about plants and about animals in, out in nature, not in a classroom and also reading. Um, so this is what we do at Audubon. We teach about Rachel Carson, but really we're teaching in a, in a way that's inspired by her life. So throughout the school year, normally at Audubon Nature Preschool, we spend most of our days outside and we encourage children to closely observe nature, to feel really connected to particular places. And in our case, that's Wood End. Um, but very specific places at Wood End that the children are, are connected to, to care deeply about animals and plants and to really wonder and to then read to learn more, to ask questions and to really celebrate our commitment to um, our planet. So um, to celebrate Rachel Carson's birthday, we actually held a special Zoom class on Rachel and um, if you're like me, you say, what preschoolers are on Zoom? But they are. They've been on Zoom for the past two months, and they, um, it's been better than we ever could have imagined it. So we, we, um, at that Zoom class, I read a biography on Rachel for children, the story of Rachel Carson. And we, we talked about it. it this uh, book talks about different um, moments and years in her life that influenced her and why she was important and how she can inspire us. So I talked about that with the five-year-olds who joined me. And then um, together we actually painted what we're calling Earth Promise Stones. So I've got mine here and I'll show you some pictures later. These were stones that had beautiful pictures or messages that people could, that the children could hide around their neighborhoods and some even went um, to Wood End. Um, we, we talk about um, how Rachel's life is much like what our school is like. She loved nature. She spent a lot of time outside wondering and studying and she cared enough about it to teach others through her words and, and actions. So I'd like to show you the, um, 
the stones that the children made and some of the delightful kids that we have um, from the school who, who shared. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Shannon. I am um, heartened during this time of shutdown to see so many families outside with their children. And one of my great hopes is that a silver lining of stay-at-home orders will be this reconnection of people of all ages to the natural world. That's so important for our physical and mental health. So thank you, Shannon, for being a great leader and guide for the littlest naturalists in our community. So now we've gone from a biography of Rachel Carson for children to having a chance to hear from the preeminent biographer of Rachel Carson. Author and ANS member Linda Lear is going to join us next. And one of my great joys in being um, a member of the Audubon Natural Society community is having had the chance to meet an author I admired so much and I don't think I'm stretching when I say that we've become fast friends. So now I'll turn it over to Linda. Am I there? Hi. Hi. Thank you all and what wonderful comments that have gone on already um, with which I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, Shirley Briggs and Rachel Carson would would go to Ultrabald Glover Park to to see birds and to walk together in nature, and it was a favorite haunt for both of them. I wanted to change the the talk a little bit um, and reiterate um, what Jennifer said about children's education. I first came to Audubon Naturalist because our son was in one of the little Audubon classes that was held down in the little house. And he enjoyed it so very much that he went on to Indian camp the, one summer next. And that was even more thrilling. So the wonderful childhood education that you do hands on is a, is a memorable one for all of us. I wanted to talk a little bit, not about Silent Spring, but about Rachel's small little book called A Sense of Wonder that was published in 1956. Carson wrote this eloquent and deeply moving book um, because she wanted to, to uh, share with her family and especially with her five-year-old nephew um, something about the, the kind of childhood education that she um, felt was the best. She had already become quite famous by 1956 because in 1951, The Sea Around Us had been published, uh, <coughs> excuse me, followed by, um, under the, uh, followed by uh, The Sea Around Us and um, The Edge of the Sea in 1955. The summer of 1956 was one of the happiest summers of Rachel's life. She had purchased a cozy little cottage on the shore of, of uh, the Sheepscot River near Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. Rachel would go up there with her to observe nature and to share the sea. She was always accompanied by her elderly mother and often in the company of her uh, orphaned nephew, Roger Christie, who at the time of this essay was about five or six years old. He was a lonely little boy and he had had and he was an eager companion and filled with all the childhood curiosity um, that goes with that age. 
Rachel writes of holding Roger in her arms, standing at the big picture window in their cottage, looking out at the sea, listening to the surf, and paying no attention to bedtime hours and what time it was. The sense of wonder, she, call, she recalls a time when she bundled Roger in a beach towel and took him down to the little beachhead, which seemed almost like a little island all to themselves, and listened to the wind, the sounds of the sea, and the seabirds that were there. The only reminder of others was a few lights on the cottages down the hill, and otherwise, she writes, she was alone with Roger in the sea. The patterns of constellations flowing across the sky, and once or twice a meteor turned this way across the sky. It occurred to me that even if you don't know the name of a single star, you can still drink in the beauty and the wonder of what you see. And so here comes her theme, just look. And often it's also look up. I think that um, she found that the world was full of little things. Um, all of them often seem too seldom. And now she turns to her imagination and takes Roger on pleasures of walking in the spruce forest and finding um, little squirrel houses and maybe even um, a circus uh, squirrels had made with uh, some twigs and nuts. So they talked about how important it was to go off in the woods together. That was one of Rachel's themes too, and one that ANS has incorporated so well. She always talked about the the, the, the accompanying a child and an adult together in the woods or in the forest or in nature was so important because a child's sense of wonder could be nourished and, and embedded in their outlook together for the rest of their lives. She writes, if a child is to keep his sense of inborn sense of wonder without any gift, without, sorry, without such gift from the fairies, he needs to have the companionship of at least one adult who can, he can share it with and discover with and find the joy and the, <clears throat> and the determination and the mystery that we live in. Um, last pleasures of the natural world, Carson reminds us, are available to anyone who will place themselves under this earth, the sea, and the sky, and find this amazing life. Finally, I want to underscore what Carson never directly says, but implies throughout this marvelous little book and in all her other works as well. Look to look, learn to look with all your senses. There is no need for teaching, only guidance in observing. This is exactly the mission of Audubon Natural Society and is what you do so well. Rachel rarely used the word teach, um, but she did use the word company and companion and look, looking all around with someone else to guide you. So I congratulate ANS and all its um, staff and wonderful classes that you've organized because you were doing and teaching in exactly the way that Rachel Carson hoped for. I came across uh, an admonition uh, as I was working on this little talk, which Carson would enthusiastically uh, endorse, I think. Um, a man I don't know, John Clare, writes, we must teach our children to smell the earth, to taste the rain, to see things grow, to hear the sun rise and the night fall. Thank you all. Thank you, Linda. And I know that um, many of us have extra time on our hands. It's a 
perfect time to pick up Linda's biography of Rachel Carson and really get to know her and Linda's writing, which is beautiful and eloquent. I have to say, hi, mom. I saw my mom join the meeting. So good to see you, mom. I'm glad you could be here. Um, I also wanted to say that Linda's words reminded me of another ANS member who passed away in 2018, Nancy Grace Roman was a wonderful scientist herself. She was considered the um, mother of the Hubble telescope. And she describes very much what Rachel Carson described as just as a child looking up at the sky and watching the stars traverse the sky mm -hmm. and thinking that there was a way to make sense of that. And NASA just announced that they're going to name their next telescope after ANS member Nancy Grace Roman. So, as we celebrate women scientists, let's put uh, Nancy Roman in that. And one of my favorite women scientists is going to join us next, and that is our very own Stephanie Mason. I wasn't there at the very beginning. I'm um, much more comfortable outside, bending over, looking at things, or looking at things overhead. So, so excuse me for being late. Um, I'm going to use the script. It'll help me keep within my time allotment. So thank you for that crutch as well. Anyway, good afternoon. I'm sorry to be late. Um, I think if you mention the name Rachel Carson, most people will respond. Oh, yeah, I know her. She was the author of Silent Spring, the book that launched a major environmental movement in the 60s and the 70s. And importantly led to the banning of the Backyards Pesticide DDT. They recognize her first and foremost as a barrier-breaking female scientist, which of course she was indeed. But if the person you're talking to is a naturalist, they will very likely and very quickly add, and she was the writer of the touchstone book for nature educators, The Sense of Wonder. In fact, they might even mention this book first. In it, Carson recounts her nature outings with her young nephew, Roger, which Linda just talked about. She observes that if a child is to keep alive his inborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with him the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. I was lucky to have parents play that role in my childhood years. As a naturalist who works with adults, though, I know it's equally important to continue nurturing humans' inborn sense of wonder throughout our lives. It took me a while in my naturalist career to get comfortable saying, I don't know what that is. Now, guided by Rachel Carson's philosophy, I am happy to say, I have no idea what that is. But let's look at its exquisite form and where it's growing. Let's bend down and take a closer look and see what else we might learn about it. When I personally look to Rachel Carson as a role model, it's Carson the naturalist writer. In an essay in the New Yorker magazine from March 2018, Jill Lepore writes, this is her quote, Rachel spent her childhood wandering the fields and hills. Her mother taught her the names of plants and the calls of birds. Stories that Rachel wrote in her teenage years described her nature finds, the Bob White's nest, tightly packed with eggs, the Oriole's aerial cradle, the framework of sticks, which the cuckoo calls a nest, and the lichen-covered home of the hummingbird, end of quote. Aren't these the words of an observant naturalist, the worthy of our emulation? In her first book, Under the Sea Wind, in 1941, Carson penned this incredible prose. To stand at the edge of the sea, to sense the ebb and the flow of the tide, to feel the breath of a mist moving over a great salt marsh, to watch the flight of shorebirds that have swept up and down the surf lines of the continents for untold thousands of years, to see the run of the old eels and the young shad to the sea, is to have knowledge of things that are as nearly eternal as any early life can be. I love the fact that the subtitle for this best-selling book is A Naturalist's Picture of Ocean Life. 
clearly Carson intended in her writing as a naturalist to evoke vivid images of sea life and all the wild entanglements that bind its many parts. Her example is set before me each time I try to create mind's eye pictures in my own natural history essays and notes. Now, of course, there were people who considered her writing too overwrought, too florid. According to Lepore, the Atlantic magazine wouldn't publish an excerpt from her second book, The Sea Around Us, as the editors considered it too poetic. But the New Yorker's editor disagreed, and Carson's piece was featured in a three-part profile of the sea in 1951. This book went on to win the National Book Award and was on the New York Times bestseller list for 86 weeks. When it was reissued, her first book, Under the Sea, winded up, ended up excuse me, on the bestseller list as well. In the New Yorker piece, Lepore concludes that, and I quote, Carson could not have written Silent Spring if she hadn't for decades scrambled down rocks, rolled up her pants legs, and waded into tide pools, thinking about how one thing can change another, end quote. In other words, Carson's pursuit of her naturalist passions led to her strength and credibility as a scientist. As a community science researcher myself, I do more than just count butterflies. For the duration of my 22 seasons of surveying butterflies in the mountains of Colorado's Rocky Mountain National Park, I have filled my field books with records of plant species along my transect, visible changes in habitat, and both seasonal and long-term weather data, all of which might help me interpret changes in butterfly population numbers. Lepore quotes Carson in this way, stating that, quote unquote, Carson quarreled with almost all seashore books, and she said, the reason is they give the amateur a lot of separate little capsules of information about a series of creatures, which are never firmly placed in their environment. Lepore goes on to observe that Carson's seashore book was very different. It was an explanation of the shore as a system, an ecosystem. Here, I believe, Carson gives myself and other interpretive naturalists another guiding principle. Don't overlook the role of a particular plant or animal's place in its environment. Ask questions. Why is it here? What does it depend on? What depends on it? This ecosystem approach should lead us as naturalists and all conservationists for that matter to the next step in our interpretation, the pressing call to earth stewardship and environmental action so memorably exemplified in Carson's powerful and groundbreaking Silent Spring. I'll conclude by sharing this quote of Carson's, which has been a mantra for me for many years, especially the phrase, the repeated refrain of nature. I confess I have never needed these reassuring and consoling words as much as I have during this spring of 2020. Carson writes, those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. It's, um, it's marvelous to see our senior naturalist and her deep connections to Rachel Carson and her inspiration. I think we all need the comfort of nature now. It's such a challenging time for our world. I feel especially um, so, a special sorrow that our communities of color here in our nation and our community are more profoundly impacted by the effects of COVID-19 
most likely because they have also suffered from years of environmental injustice, of poorer air quality, and less access to nature. And then those assaults of having these devastating health impacts have been compounded by terrible acts of racial violence and discrimination. And so I want to call your attention to the fact that Audubon Natural Society's blog will have some comments from me um, with the great help of our communications director, Caroline Brewer, about just where we stand as an organization in standing with our communities of color to make sure that they are supported and given all the access and all the rights to good health that we, many of us, enjoy. I want to give a shout out to Council Member Tom Hucker of the Montgomery County Council. He's joined us saying that Rachel Carson inspired him to his career and he is uh, the chair of our county's environmental committee and represents the district where Rachel Carson's home is. That gives me a great chance to call your attention to the fact that Audubon Natural Society has created a Rachel Carson map. If you want to see all the sites, the parks, the homes, the places she worked, you can go to anshome.org slash Carson map and give yourself a tour of all the places that Rachel was in and around our community. I also wanted to give a shout out to Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, who couldn't be with us today. Um, but I have a wonderful story about her advocacy for Rachel Carson. I serve on the Rock Creek Park Green Ribbon Panel to help envision the next 100 years of Rock Creek Park. And uh, Delegate Norton served on that panel also. And we were outside at Rock Creek Park having a, an unveiling celebration. And I talked about Audubon Natural Society. And I talked about um, our key members like Theodore Roosevelt and Rachel Carson. And wonderful Delegate uh, Norton noticed that the superintendent of the National Park Service was sitting in the front row. You can see her there on the left. And she immediately used the podium to say, wait a minute, we need to name something after Rachel Carson. And so I just loved that she was so outspoken in lifting up Rachel Carson. And in fact, today, if you go to Glover Archibald Park, you will find a sign dedicated to Rachel Carson. Um, and so I think for us as a community, we can be proud to count Rachel Carson as one of our own. We can be inspired to continue her work, especially today when the EPA has stepped back from no less than 98 environmental protections. We can be inspired to vote, to let candidates know that we care about the environment and we support candidates who protect the environment. But mostly I think we can take some solace in these very challenging times in the wonderful poetic words of Rachel Carson. And I would like to close our gathering today by asking our Audubon Nature Preschool Director, uh, Stephanie Bazo, to read for us one of her um, favorite quotes from Rachel's book, Sense of Wonder. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's an honor to hear and to read one of my favorite parts of The Sense of Wonder, which is a beloved text by Rachel Carson by so many. Um, I'm just wrapping up my 18th year teaching, and um, this is the one text I keep coming back to with so many things written on education that really guides what we do at Audubon and how we relate to children and how we really give them that gift of wonder and celebrate it with them. So this is from The Sense of Wonder by Rachel Carson. A child's world is fresh and new and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune that for most of us, that clear-eyed vision, that true instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed and even lost before we reach adulthood. If I had influence with the good fairy who is supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder, so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantments of later years, the sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, the alienation from the sources of our strength. If a child is to keep alive their inborn sense of wonder without any such gift from the fairies, 
They need the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with them the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. Parents often have a sense of inadequacy when confronted on the one hand with the eager, sensitive mind of a child, and on the other with the world of complex physical nature, inhabited by a life so various and unfamiliar that it seems hopeless to reduce it to order and knowledge. In a mood of self-defeat, they exclaim, how can I possibly teach my child about nature? Why, I don't even know one bird from another. This resonates very true with me. I sincerely believe that for the child and for the parent seeking to guide him, it is not half so important to know as to feel. If facts are the seeds that later produce knowledge and wisdom, then the emotions and the impressions of the senses are the fertile soil in which the seeds must grow. The years of early childhood are the time to prepare the soil. Once the emotions have been aroused, a sense of the beautiful, the excitement of the new and the unknown, a feeling of sympathy, pity, admiration, or love, then we wish for knowledge about the object of our emotional response. Once found, it has the lasting meaning. It is more important to pave the way for the child to want to know than to put him on a diet of facts that he is not ready to assimilate. And that makes me a little bit emotional thinking about this is the way education is right now um, and that it's just such a gift to be able to give children this beautiful um, way to be in nature. Thank you. Lisa, you're muted. Okay, yeah, I know. <laughs> I thought I was unmuting. Anyway, I just wanted to invite everybody to um, show your video if you wish and unmute your microphone, take yourself off speaker view, put your cursor over that thing that looks like, I don't know, a big waffle and you can see everybody's face. If you just wanna wave to each other, we can close our meeting by greeting each other in the name of Rachel Carson and all the wonderful naturalists who walked with us when we were children. Thanks mom and all the uh, children that we can inspire with our love of nature. It's so good to see you all. You can click a cursor to the left or right of your screen and you'll be able to see more folks in the room. So if you wanna just get a chance to see all those people you miss so much. It's just great to see you all. I wanna thank you for celebrating Rachel's birthday with Audubon Naturalist Society today. And do check out annashome.org. We have lots of online content for you to enjoy and stay connected to nature. It's just great to see everybody. Thanks for being part of the meeting. <laughs>